Yes, we will wish you and invite uh, the distinguished uh, speakers of panel three. That will be headed by my colleague uh, Thomas Martin, who is a researcher uh, in prison uh, issues uh, and has focused specifically on disciplinary regimes uh, in different countries in the world and currently involved in a large project in Myanmar. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, fueled up after lunch and uh, hopefully energized. Um, it's a privilege uh, to chair this uh, panel for the third session. Uh, and uh, now we move into uh, concrete questions. How is solitary confinement used as a disciplinary measure? What we call a strafcelle or punishment cell in Denmark, and what are the areas of concern? Some of the questions we hope that uh, this panel will address and also raise is uh, how does Denmark currently use solitary confinement as a disciplinary measure? And how is this used in relation to the recent regulation on mobile phones in prisons, for instance? What are the durations involved? Durations we have talked a lot about in relation to time. And how does the Danish NPM uh, monitor solitary confinement as a disciplinary measure? We might also uh, touch issues on how inmates can complain about these measures. So a broad area of uh, questions and uh, in general what we hope to move into now is how do these international standards and these health concerns that we have uh, learned about uh, the research uh, in the morning, how do they resonate in practice with the Danish prison culture and Danish prison practice? The research we do here uh, on prisons, uh, a lot of it happens also south of the Alps, but uh, across the world we, we stress the importance of local context, histories, politics, <coughs> cultures, capacities, what we have termed the prison climate. And what are the prison climates in Denmark in relation to the use of solitary confinement? Maybe we'll learn a little bit about, uh, a little bit about that in practice. Um, we've also stressed and emphasized the importance, as both Karen uh, mentioned this morning and Sharon, that uh, to view the prison as an inherently relational institution. And we talk a lot about relations in terms of staff-prisoner relationships, uh, but there are other actors uh, in this relational environment. Uh, it's the managers, the practitioners, and the monitors. And that um, group of actors has um, a very important role to play uh, in actually making reform efforts gain local traction in everyday life. Uh, and in that respect, uh, we have a very strong panel with us here today, uh, representing um, these groups of voices uh, and um, people who can be involved in, in actually moving things forward. Um, we have with us uh, Annette Estoff, uh, Director of the Center of Execution of Sentences in Denmark's Prison and Probation Service. Um, and it has also worked as a liaison officer for the CPT, but also as an investigation officer for the parliamentary office map. So, you have been uh, on both sides of the table in, in that respect. Um, we also have um, Morten Engberg, head of the Danish parliamentary ombudsman, uh, monitoring department, uh, and in change of, among other things, the independent monitoring of places of detention. We also have uh, Jonas Christoffersen, Director of the Danish Institute for Human Rights and also a member of the National Prevention Mechanism. Uh, and finally, uh, last but not least, we have a uh, representative, uh, the Union Secretary of the Danish Prison and Probation, uh, Danish Prison Officers Union, uh, who has uh, profound experience from the prison landings, uh, including 15 years working as a prison guard. Uh, I should also mention that uh, Jonas here also is a prolific researcher and writer on human rights in Denmark and has recently published on the democratic challenges of human rights um, and how to strike the balance between human rights and politics. And I've also had the pleasure of working with Morten uh, as a, 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 on an NPM visit uh, under his leadership and known as a thorough and <laughs> constructive monitor. So we have a strong panel here. Um, we'll have uh, presentations of uh, about 10 minutes each and uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, plenty of questions and comments from the floor, so I hope you'll try to stick to that. Um, we'll have a few clarifying uh, questions after each presentation, but make sure just to just details and practicalities so we don't open up to big discussions until we've heard from all speakers. So, um, 
with those words, uh, please, Annette. Thank you. Can you hear? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to come here uh, and uh, uh, participate in the debate about the use of uh, solitary confinement as a, a punishment uh, in Denmark uh, and to give a short presentation. I'm so sorry I wasn't able to be here this morning uh, to uh, listen to the <coughs> presentations on uh, international standards and health uh, questions, uh, but unfortunately, unfortunately I wasn't able to change my plans, so I have to live with that handicap. Um, okay. Uh, to start with, I will uh, limit my presentation uh, by explaining that we have, uh, as you probably know, two different forms of isolation of inmates. Um, I'm not speak speaking about uh, the court's uh, decisions on isolation, <coughs> but uh, the decisions made by prison staff. We have what we call, call exclusion from association, uh, which is a preventive measure normally uh, for security reasons uh, and it is in determinate uh, which is perhaps the most important difference between the two kind of isolation. <coughs> the second one is punishment cell which is a punitive measure uh, with the purpose to react to breaches and uh, as you will know it, it is a determinate uh, reaction uh, maximum for four weeks. Um, the two kind of isolation are uh, carried out uh, in the same way in the same uh, special cells or in the inmate cells and I think perhaps some prisoners um, do not understand the subtle distinction between the two of them uh, but they probably will uh, see there's a difference because one of them is time limited and the other one is not. But what I'm going to speak about today is only punishment cell because that's the topic uh, of the conference. I'm a little sad, I would rather have uh, talked about the other kind of isolation because as you can see from the numbers here, uh, we have worked hard uh, the latest year on bringing down, uh, reducing the use of exclusion from association uh, with a certain success. Um, I couldn't say the same about punishment, so as you can, could, could see from the number. I also would think that the harmfulness of uh, exclusion from association is um, harder than from punishment cell because for an inmate, I as a lay person would think that it would be more harmful to be uh, isolated uh, without any time limit than to be isolated with a time limit. You probably probably discuss this this morning. Um, we have, as you probably also will know, uh, I think what I can say today is very little uh, to add to the uh, paper you got uh, on beforehand and uh, those who have done their homework uh, and read the discussion paper will probably be rather bored because uh, I'm saying a lot of the same things. We have three kinds of disciplinary punishments in Denmark. We have warnings, fines and punishment cell. Uh, most of the disciplinary punishments are warnings and fines, but we still have many uh, uh, cases of punishment cell too. I won't say a lot about the European prison, ru prison rules. I guess you have discussed this this morning. Uh, but of course, we are trying to practice our rules so that they uh, do not contradict the European prisons, prison rules that uh, solitary confinement shall be imposed uh, only in exceptional cases and for a specified period of time, which shall be as short as possible. <coughs> Uh, as for the rules um, we have in our law, uh, 
a list of serious offenses that uh, may be met with punishment cell, um, and the duration of punishment cell must be fixed uh, in view of the nature and scope of the breach and may not exceed a period of four weeks. And the punishment cell is served in a special unit or in the inmate's own room or in a local prison. Uh, we don't have special uh, rules that they are not allowed to watch television, to read books and so on. They can do the same uh, do the same activities in their own cell as in the punishment cell, uh, but the difference is that uh, they're excluded from association uh, with other inmates. We have some guidelines uh, in the discussion paper. Uh, they are called um, um, a form of normal reactions uh, for uh, reactions to disciplinary, disciplinary offences. Uh, the different, differing from type of institution, from open prison to growth prison and to remand prison, and they are covering all kind of what we call normal offences. And an important thing is that they are not binding; they are only guiding, uh, because each case, of course, must uh, be considered. Uh, uh, there must be made a specific assessment uh, of uh, the the. Uh, what has been, what has happened uh, in each case. We have special guidelines for young offenders uh, under 18 years. Uh, we have sent instructions out in 2014 and again in 2015, saying that uh, you are not allowed to use the ordinary guidelines. Um, you shall have special focus on limiting the use of punishment cell for uh, juveniles um, and you should only use it when it is absolutely necessary and even then you should consider the possibility of uh, making the punishment cell suspended. <clears throat> and in 2016 we had uh, 14 cases where a uh, punishment cell was used uh, for uh, for young offenders under 18 years. A few words, since I only have very short time left, um, about complaints and judicial review. Uh, if you <coughs> have, uh, if you have a disciplinary punishment of punishment cell, uh, you can appeal it to the Department of Prison and Probation at administratively appeal. Uh, very few does. Um, if you have a punishment of uh, more than seven days, seven days or more, uh, you may ask to have the case brought for the courts uh, for review, uh, and very few does that too. We had three cases in 2013, um, none in two, 2014 and 2015, and I think at the moment we have one case uh, before the court. Unsuspended punishment cells uh, are used in very few uh, cases for first-time offences. Uh, it is um, offences as threats and violence against staff and between inmates, escape and or intended escape, smuggling, sale, possession of weapons or hard drugs, uh, greater quantities of hash and alcohol, serious <coughs> vandalism and a very new one, um, since 2016, I think you talked about that this, that this morning, <coughs> possession of mobile phones. Uh, I'm going to say a little more about that, because it has really changed our statistics. Uh, we had a change of law in August 2016, um, where the possession of mobile phones in closed prisons was penalized, um, and uh, there was a political decision that uh, disciplinary punishments uh, for uh, possessing mobile phones illegally uh, shall be tripled. <clears throat> this means that today you have for first time offences uh, in closed in institutions a, a punishment cell uh, for 15 days, second time 21 days and third time 28 days. Uh, in open prison you have first time 7 days suspended uh, next time seven days unsuspended and uh, third time ten days unsuspended. I'm not going to say uh, 
a lot about the decision because it was a political decision. I'm not going to defend it. I'm not going to criticize it uh, because that's not my job to do. I'm a civil servant and uh, when the politicians and the uh, parliament uh, make a decision uh, and it's a lawful uh, uh, legal decision, uh, and, uh, it's up to us to fulfill uh, the decision and that's what we have done, which you can see from the statistics. Um, you can see in 2016 we have a, a serious uh, increase of uh, punishment cell, uh, which is uh, almost uh, only uh, due to the uh, decision about uh, mobile telephones. The politicians don't want uh, illegal communication in the prisons, uh, and that's what you can see from the statistics uh, that we have tried to um, we have tried to fight the mobile phones in the uh, prisons. <coughs> uh, we, made, we don't have statistics on the length of uh, punishment cell, which I regret, uh, and I think we should have statistics on that. Um, but uh, we made a manual uh, examination showing that in 2015, we had seven cases of punishment cell uh, 15 days or more. Uh, and in 2016, we had 222 cases uh, of, where, of where 219 were about illegal communication, uh, which means mobile, mobiles and etc. Um, I think the, the increase uh, of um, punishment cell for uh, illegal possession of mobile phones, it has had some preventive effect because the number of mobile phones that we are finding is, has, um, has uh, decreased, um, but uh, as you can see, it hasn't had a very, uh, very great uh, um, effect because we still have a lot of cases. Uh, at last, I will raise a few questions for discussion, um, and my final, um, qu my first question will be: uh, How do we react to serious and repeated breaches of rules in prisons? Uh, I think you could compare with uh, <coughs> the use of prison as a penal um, um, sanction. Uh, not many people believe in prisons. Um, but still we use prisons for serious and repeated crime uh, because we don't know what else to do. And it's, I think it's the same about punishment cell. Uh, not many people are happy about isolating inmates, but uh, for serious and repeated uh, offenses inside the prisons, we don't know what to do else. Um, Another question is, do we have better alternative, or, or the same question, do we have better alternative measures? Um, I don't think it's better to uh, extend the sentence, prolong the sentence, uh, or to uh, expose the use of uh, release on parole. Uh, I think that's perhaps even worse. But I would like very much to have <coughs> good ideas uh, on what we could use as alternative measures to uh, isolation. I look forward to the next panel where I, I think we're going to hear uh, some ideas on that subject. Um, another question is, do we have better means to counteract breaches uh, of rules in the prisons? At the moment we, have, we are starting a pilot project with jamming. Um, and I think if we succeed with that project, we will, we will really be able to um, reduce the use of punishment cell because I'm sure that uh, if prisoners are not able to use mobile phones in the prisons, they won't smuggle them in anymore. So that will be very good for our statistics, um, I think. <laughs> so I think I've already spoken a few minutes more than I was supposed to, so thank you for the... Um, for the word, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Annette. The, the very pertinent questions uh, we will uh, save for the end uh, once we've been through the other speakers. But is there any kind of clarifying uh, questions to uh, Annette's presentation about statistics, numbers, anything? Uh,
Peter. Yes. Just very briefly, uh, why are the numbers for 2015 so relatively low compared to the other years for the use of punishment cells? I mean, that's a very interesting question, I think. Yeah. I don't think I'd be able to answer. One answer will be that the number of prisoners uh, was very low in 2015. We had about one uh, fifth uh, less prisoners than we had in uh, earlier years. So that that would be some of the uh, the answer, but perhaps not the whole. I'm not able to give you a, a total uh, answer now. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to the next speaker. We heard from the prison and uh, probation service, uh, the management level now, uh, the other actors, the one who has tasked to monitor what goes on. Oh, thank you. Um, I had a PowerPoint presentation as well. Is it uh, here? Uh, yeah. Right. Um, I would like to start to say thank you for this opportunity to speak at this brilliant conference. And um, I would like to tell you a bit about the Ombudsman's work dealing with the monitoring of, amongst other things, prison services. Um, the Ombudsman started, if I can say something briefly about the history, the Ombudsman started in 1956 doing his first monitoring visit to a prison in Copenhagen called the Western Prison. Um, this was not actually intended by those who made the institution of the Ombudsman, it was not part of the, of the Ombudsman Act, that he should do this thing. He did it on his own accord. He thought this was important to do, so he did it. And only years later has been put into the Ombudsman Act that he can actually do this sort of thing. But he acted on his own accord uh, initially, <clears throat> and of course there was no such thing as opcat in those days. He simply did it because he thought it was the right thing to do for an Ombudsman. And this was a year after the Ombudsman Institution was, was erected, so it was a very new thing indeed um, that he did this. And he continued doing this, and his successors continued doing this for the years coming afterwards. And in 1994, Denmark had a visit from the, from the CBT, and they recommended that there be some sort of regular inspection or monitoring of Danish Prison and Probation Service and um, the, that was decided then and that should be the Ombudsman who did that. So in 1997 the work was intensified and there was made a more regular systematic inspections of Danish prisons by the Ombudsman after 97. Um, and then in 2009 the Ombudsman was appointed as NPM under the OPCAT, working together closely I might say with dignity and also with the Institute of Human, uh, the Institute of Human Rights, so that when we go on our monitoring visits, we often go <coughs> all three parts of us: uh, the Ombudsman, Dignity, and the Institute for Human Rights. And um, we changed the way we did this work some years ago. We now have what we call focus areas where we focus on specific aspects of life in prison and in other centres of detention. We don't only go to prisons, we also go to, for instance, psychiatric wards or asylum centres <coughs> and also certain social institutions we also visit. Um, and we basically have, so we have certain focus areas which we always focus on whenever we make one of these inspections. And one of our focus areas is the use of force and other types of enforcement. And that could be solitary um, confinement as a dis disciplinary measures or otherwise. It could also be informal measures, things which are not formalized, but nevertheless they work as a way of enforcement towards the prisoner or the patient or the inhabitant. We have also six other focus areas. I should like to tell you about them. I don't think the time allows me to do that, so I shall leave that out. Um, whenever we go to a place, a prison, we always ask on forehand to have information about the use of, amongst other things, 
um, punishment cells. We asked for statistics three years back. How have you been using punishment cells? <coughs> We'd like to know that beforehand. And um, how many incidents have you had? How many inmates have been involved in this? What are the total number of days? There may not be uh, statistics for the whole country, but we nevertheless expect the prison to provide us with this information for their prison. And what are the average number of days <coughs> for each incident? And what are the length of punishments? So that we have a clear picture before we go, what are the situation like in this prison um, when we talk about punishment cells and also a number of the other issues we ask for the same sort of statistics. When we go then, we always start with a meeting with the management of, this, of the prison. We always have a meeting lasting easily two hours, three hours sometimes, where we talk about the general situation at the prison and we always talk about one of the issues we talk about is precisely the use of punishment cells. What's the situation like? Has there been a development? Have they had an increase? Have they had a decrease? <clears throat> we heard about mobile phones being one of the big issues when you talk about punishment cells. So we hear about, is that the same in this particular prison? I went to a prison in, in the um, southern part of Jutland last week. It didn't seem to have quite the same problem as other places, although they knew it as well. So the, the problem may be different in different prisons. Um, what are the causes for any development? Does the management does the management follow the development and do they have an explanation for what are the causes for development, either going up or going down? <coughs> and what do they do to counteract the damaging effects? We all know, and we heard this morning, there are damaging effects of isolation. And what is management doing to counteract those effects? We always ask these questions and we expect to get a reasonable answer from the management, what they do in these in these matters. And then afterwards, after the meeting, um, we go out to the and visit the prisoners and talk to staff in the prison. What are their experience? We always make a point of visiting the isolation cells. They can be used for punishment. They can also be used for other purposes, as we just heard. We always try to speak to those prisoners who are in those cells. What is it like for them? What is their situation? to make sure that there's no one there whose situation ought to be changed. What I'd like to say is that we also focus on other types of isolation. <coughs> Punishment cells may not be our main focus, although it's one of our focuses. Security cells in prisons is one of our big issues. Exclusion from association, as we heard before, is also one of our big issues. And, and some new topics, so-called focus wards, which is almost isolation, perhaps not quite, but it's, it's getting there. And uh, we had last year an issue concerning the prison in Vesuzalil. I think Peter Schaaf was telling earlier about Vesuzalil being the first Danish prison, first modern Danish prison, is nowadays it was closed down in 2015 because it was too old. Mm -hmm. And then they, they opened it again very shortly afterwards. They were forced to open it, you might say, because there was a large influx of immigrants and some of them had to be detained in this very old prison. Um, and they were actually being detained under quite um, severe conditions, many of them being isolated for long periods of the day. And we questioned why were they being isolated? And actually, fortunately, the, the management was very attentive. They listened to what we said. And they shared our concern and they have now um, they have eased the conditions for those people who are being held in this prison, fortunately. So those are other types of isolation that we also focus on. <coughs> we also focus on what you might call de facto isolation, <coughs> where you don't have an actual decision about isolating the person, but nevertheless they're being held under such conditions that de facto they are being isolated. There are certain prisoners in what called Copenhagen Police Headquarters Prison. They are held under such conditions that they are very close to being isolated, which is because they have to, you have to have four, three or four prison guards sometimes to bring them out of the cell, and sometimes they are not being brought out at all. Um, we have the Western Hospital, connected to the Western Prison, where you have some psychiatric patients there who tend to isolate themselves. And it's important to us <coughs> that these people are not being de facto isolated. And 
a new concept has been introduced concerning prisoners who are charged with terrorism or actually being convicted of terrorism. It's called especially sharpened attention, I think, if you translate it into English. And uh, it also carries effects which might lead to de facto isolation. So it's one of those things that we also um, have in our focus. So I'm saying this because it's important for me to say that punishment cells is certainly one concern, but we have other types of isolation which is just as important as this one. Thank you. Yes, that's true. What I'm talking about here is well, we, the sort of statistics that we get beforehand. Mm -hmm. we, you may well ask, or we may ask, when we are there, what is the longest number of days you have? So you're quite right, that's important as well. Uh, sorry, can you just tell us a little bit more about the uh, sharpened attention? It's, uh, I love the euphemism, it's a great... Uh... Uh, well, the sharpened attention, <laughs> it's... Um, it's a security measure, um, and uh, it, it doesn't, in legal terms, it doesn't involve isolation, but the other prisoners, that's what we heard at least, it's a very new phenomenon, so there may well be things about it that we don't know, um, but what we heard is that other prisoners are frightened to associate with those prisoners who are under this sharpened attention, because then they might think, then the authorities might think, that they are also sympathizers with terrorism. So they tend to avoid them, and that creates a situation which is de facto isolation. Perhaps, but I'm talking about something we haven't investigated fully, so I'm only mentioning certain things that we find worth investigating. Thank you very much. Um, I will now give the word to uh, Jonas Gustafsson uh, from the Danish Institute of Human Rights, uh, director there, also part of the LPM. And Jonas will tell us about the use of staff in Denmark, um, human rights concerns. Please. Thank you, Thomas. And Thomas is a, a living example of the close cooperation between the Institute and the and Dignity, because Thomas used to work at the Danish Institute for Human Rights and was then transferred to Dignity very recently. Um, and also, I'm, I'm quite sorry I wasn't here this morning. Um, basically, I was going to go with Kain to, uh, to on, a, on an OPCAT inspection. Uh, it was very important for us that it became an OPCAT inspection. Therefore, we had to have somebody go. Uh, and since I had to do something at home this morning, we received a new communication director at the Institute. Louise was going to go here went to the OPCAT inspection. Uh, so there's a fully fledged OPCAT inspection um, today going on with all three of us, so it, it's, it's ongoing. But thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Um, I, in a way, share the, uh, the observation that's, that punishment cell is just one issue, uh, but the other hand, it's such a special issue, I think it's very good re reason for putting a special focus on it. Uh, so basically, we can treat it with the kind of detailed uh, attention that I think it, it, uh, it really deserves. Um, and from a human rights perspective, you can say, okay, what is the human rights perspective on this? And Thomas mentioned the issue of, of the distinction between human rights law and human rights policy work. Uh, and I think this is an area which is very uh, good to use from a, an attached address from a human rights policy perspective. Uh, because you can say, if you look at what is the, the, the very bottom lower level that you can treat inmates on, how, how low can you go, that's where human rights law really set in. Uh, the hard law, minimum standards that will be enforced by international courts and so on. But there's also a, a higher level, uh, which is a soft, soft law level, 
uh, which is where we talk about when we talk about recommendations for the CPT and, and so on. That's the level we're talking about. Uh, and the question, of course, is where, where is Denmark when you look at these two levels? Uh, and I think the answer right now is we we haven't fallen beyond something that has been set by courts to be a strict violation of of international human rights law in the most narrow sense that you can find it, namely violation of Article 3 of the Human Rights Convention. Uh, but that doesn't mean that this isn't a human rights concern that we should work with uh, very seriously. Um, so I think it's, it's really uh, good that the focus is being uh, turned to this, to this area. If I look at, if you look at the, the Danish rules, when you look at it from the, um, from the outset, it's of course it's striking that some of the, it's called a punishment cell, it's an administrative system, but some of it is, is basically just crime committed inside a prison. So in a way you have this mini criminal justice system within the criminal justice system, which in itself is weird when you look at it from, from the outside. Um, but that's in fact the, the way it is. Um, and if you look at it from, from a, a human rights perspective, one of, the, one of the most important focus areas of course is the duration. Uh, we have at the institute uh, made a recommendation that we should now limit or limit the duration to 15 days. Um, at least that's a starting point. We know from other countries that uh, some of the Nordic countries have also have a two weeks limit. And some don't use it at all. So that could be a starting point. And you might even hit the mobile phones with a, with a, some of them with, with two weeks. Um, but of course, it would be political practical uh, counter arguments. But how do we go? How do we move forward? Uh, and duration certainly is is one of the the areas. And if you only have very few cases uh, or had over seven days, why is it that you basically need uh, four weeks at a time? The other focus point is, I think, um, special uh, inmates or most vulnerable inmates, and one of them is of course children. Uh, and basically, policy recommendations should always be no isolation of children. Period. Um, if you look at the Danish uh, Act on Enforcement of, of Sentences, you don't have any special rules on uh, on children. Pregnant women, of course. Uh, special vulnerable inmates with the mental conditions, mental problems. That may they may be suicidal and, and all that. Uh, how do you how do you deal with them? And of course, you could also have. Um, forward talk to victims, um, other people who have PTSD or whatever it may be. Uh, the question is how do, how do we screen them? Uh, how do we monitor them? Uh, we have that dis discussion in the NPM on, on what, what can we basically, what can we recommend as an NPM to Danish prison authorities in terms of medical doctors screening uh, these inmates. Uh, in many times, they, they, many, many cases, the, the practice is that somebody sticks his or her head through the door and say, okay, how are you today? Okay, you look good. Bye bye. Uh, so how how does that work? And that that kind of a practical everyday practical life, how do you do that? You might have a nurse that looks at people, a social worker, and so how do how do you how do you really do it? Uh, and one thing is, I think also you 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 would know that situation. You, you do the best you can, and you're not qualified. You're not you may be qualified to the best of your ability, but how do we really screen uh, those who might be in in, in danger? Um, and that's of course a very specific um, decision in every case, how, how is that you should, you should really do it. So I would say, I mean, it's the duration, it's the special vulnerable inmates that should be at the focus of attention. And I think of course uh, data uh, is important. Um, is what it has, there's a problem in the prison authorities, uh, basically with the data collection system, how do you register stuff? Um, and if you had one, uh, super new computer and computerized system then you could just add, add on and add new kinds of information and it, if it were very easy also to register the information when you were doing your work and the everyday life we could have much more data uh, but there's clearly an issue of what what uh, what data do we collect uh, on an overall management level not only in the specific prison and, and now the bigger areas but also on a national level how do we then analyze that data um, that's, that's an issue that it's it's an ongoing concerns also of the, the prison authorities. A fourth area that I would uh, highlight is also the basically the, the impact of the effect of isolation. I, I don't think we can research enough on it, uh, different kinds of, of, um, of impacts in different situations. How do we really understand the, the impact 
uh, also maybe of, of, of shorter periods of isolation. If we have, have now this increase in mobile phones, if you can't fix it with the with jamming uh, the area uh, that continues, what what, what effect would that would that have on on, on inmates' um, life and their rehabilitation mm -hmm. and and all that? Okay, so so, so this basically some of the issues that I would pinpoint from from a human rights perspective, um, and all of this basically say uh, we need we need to work on, on this and and. At the time being, uh, there's a policy work going on lifting the, the, the standards and lifting the barrier. Uh, so the, the soft law standards are likely to increase also the hard law standards. Um, but as long as they haven't been lifted, we have to basically wait for politicians to do what's, what's better than, than today. And I think, Thomas, you mentioned in the beginning, uh, what is the prison practice and culture, what is the climate? Uh, and today, of course, we have a politically quite rough, quite a rough climate. And it is in that quite rough climate that we need to take care of the individuals. Um, so that basically we don't inflict more suffering and more pain uh, than <coughs> necessary. Um, and then it was to say, okay, what's the necessary? Who makes that determination? Isn't that exactly why we have politicians? So they can be responsible for how bad we treat people. Um, and the answer, of course, is yes, it is a political decision how to treat individuals, but from a human rights perspective, it's also an idea to have some cap on the power of, of politicians. So it's a, it's a tough area to, to work in, uh, but I think the only way forward basically is to, to keep pointing at the issues, keep working on them, keep having data on it and the, the impact of have the stories told of those who have, who have tried it, uh, and then it will go up and down. Right now it goes down, or well, the numbers go up, but the treatment goes down, um, and we have to just count it together and talk with our politicians, not to them, with them, about what the what's going on and what can be done, uh, and then it's likely to change sometime in the future. And if we go to prison, give the mobile phone outside and behave, then you'll be better off. Thank you. First of all, thanks for the invitation to this very interesting debate on a very delicate and very difficult issue. I'm honored to be here today and hopefully be able to provide an angle from the reality, sorry for that term, but often when this matter is debated, this angle is forgotten. As stated in the speaker's biographies, my background is 15 years in the Danish penal system on the right side of the door. Uh, but often when this matter, uh, sorry, sorry, the latest 10 of these exclusively as a prison guard in the section for solitary confinement and maximum security section, which also is solitary confinement, in the state prison of Newborn. Present days I work in the prison guard labors union in Denmark, as mentioned. So these 10 years has given me first-hand experience in how solitary confinement as a tool for desired change of behavior influences on inmates' lives and their mental health. In my opinion, the dilemma uh, when considering use of solitary confinement is two ways. One, the regard for the inmate in question, and two, regard for staff, other inmates, and of course, security and state property. We have to acknowledge that we in the Danish penal system has people with such a degree of antisocial behavior that measures have to be taken in order to protect the prior mentioned regards. 
This in particular is a pe in a penal system such as the Danish. In Denmark, our penal system is built around an extended degree of cooperation between inmate and staff. This means that staff has to be able to move around in any parts of the prison, of the prison on their own without being exposed to reprisal from inmates in order to affect the inmates in a positive way regarding their chosen way of life. This to try and provide them with an alternative way of life in the, li in the time after imprisonment. This unfortunately means that we are left with some hard choices. To exclude a number of inmates from general population to, for the benefit of the majority. This in the awareness that we know that solitary confinement is damaging to the human mind and in some ways also to the physical well-being. Very often I um, very often I experienced that people collapsed physically when restricted in solitary confinement. Often they often they will stop shaving, stop showering, stop washing their clothes. Inmates have to wash their own clothes in Denmark and in other ways to stop caring for themselves. This of course first become an issue when in solitary confinement for a longer period of time. The often used period will be three, five, seven days and these matters will not occur in that time frame. But of course we also see inmates in solitary confinement for a much longer period of time, weeks, months and very rarely uh, for years. We call that something else but for the inmates that's just words on a piece of paper. It doesn't really affect life in the cell. Another focus point that we have to consider is the fact that we as staff in these sections get so used to abnormal behavior in the inmates that we start noticing that's not caring. It becomes the new normal, so to speak. This, of course, allows the inmates to be in an extreme degree of behavioral patterns before we take notice. This is not due to cruelty from the staff, but due to the fact that the normal behavior in these sections differs very much from normal behavior elsewhere in society. Society in this matter being general population. So, to conclude my opening statement, I'm neither for nor I'm, I'm against solitary confinement. I'm simply concluding that it's a delicate matter and I have yet to see the alternative to solitary confinement as we have to protect the staff as well as other inmates which are in our custody. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, Clarifying questions to Paul. There's one down there. Yes, please. Uh, yes, I have a clarifying question because it sounded a little bit like you were talking about exclusion from the public, from the general population, more rather than facile uh, the disciplinary punishment. Uh, is that true, or do I misunderstand you? I maybe not uh, totally uh, uh, made it totally clear, but it it, it was about um, first of all. The, the, the punishment cell, but but as we heard uh, earlier today, uh, very often uh, we also use the measurement after uh, the punishment cell. It it goes for a very long time, and and for the for the inmates, they, they, they don't really distinguish between the two. It, it's just words on a piece of paper. And it, it doesn't really uh, make that much of a difference. The rules are a little different between the two, but but for the inmates, they they they, um, they experience the same thing about the two. So I, I think it, it's very in the inmates' perspective, it's very different to to distinguish between the two types. And and I was going for making that clear. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, panel. Uh, we've been uh, across a very uh, different but uh, also coalescing perspectives from management, from monitors, from people on the landings. Uh, we are very fortunate that we actually have quite some time.
for discussion. Uh, so I hope that uh, you now uh, help us engage uh, with these questions that uh, have been raised. So I'd like to open the floor. Uh, we had one question regarding mobile phones. I don't know if we could maybe start off with that. Yes, um, what is this thing about mobile phones uh, that is going on here in Denmark? Um, Jonas uh, has volunteered to start off. Yeah, it's basically to uh, not ask an editor to answer it uh, too directly. <laughs> On 28th of January 2016, the Minister of Justice Søren Pitt was on the front homepage of Denmark's radio uh, after uh, mobile phones were found um, in the investigation of uh, a terrorist terror case. So some, some terror uh, suspects had had uh, mobile phones in the prisons. 28th of, 28th of January. Um, 1st of March, a uh, terror suspect has again has had a mobile phone in his prison. 3rd of March, uh, the terror suspect had mobile phones 12 times. Now Minister Pitt uh, takes action. That's why mobile phones is such a big deal, I think. Well, fair enough, but are all the 229 cases, what was it? of mobile phone fine, I doubt they're all terror suspects, are they? Or are they? <laughs> I, think the, I think the political reason is when, when, you, when you have cases like this uh, in a regime which is supposed not to have mobile phones because not supposed to talk to anybody, then you had a call for political action and that political action was taken then was not taken only directed at terror suspects because they were subject to other people also to the, to the same rules. But it became a big deal after this. Do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think Jonas says, said most that uh, I would have, say, have, say, but, uh, but have said, but uh, uh, the political decision is not that terrorists are not allowed to have mobile phones in prison. It is that none of the prisoners are allowed to have mobile phones in the prisons because uh, with mobile phones you, can, you may commit new crimes, you may threat victims, you may um, plan to escape and so on. So the decision was to forbid mobile phones in all the prisons, open prisons and closed prisons. I, and of course I understand that and understand the rationale. I'm just trying to be a bit provocative and I guess my comment earlier was more that we need to question the whole issue rather than just enforce it uh, because uh, Peter was, was commenting and I agree. Uh, I think in many cases what we find is that the prisoner actually wants to speak to their family, uh, there aren't enough phones on the landing, uh, so maybe the political masters of Denmark, maybe as well as prohibiting mobile phones, which is understandable, we should also make sure that all the prisoners have good access to telephones to speak to their family and friends, because we need to encourage this contact. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, just a small comment. Uh, as Bo explained, we have in Danish <coughs> prisons, uh, most of the prisoners are uh, together, uh, they're outside the cell. So if you have one mobile in the prison, everyone in the prison may use it. Also, the person uh, sentenced for terrorism or uh, um, suspected for terrorism. So if, if you should follow the political idea, um, you should, uh, you should forbid mobile phones in prisons if, if you uh, will be quite sure that uh, no, not, no of the terrorists have uh, access to mobile phones. I'm sorry, maybe also my point was that we need to have other phones, not mobile phones. We have a good, good provision of telephones. That's, that's yeah. what I was saying. Um, I think Bob will also have comments on this. I think it's what we call uh, collateral damage. Mm -hmm. When, when politicians uh, take action on, on, on single cases uh, in the media in, in, in this uh, in this event uh, terrorists or suspected terrorists and then you, you hit a lot of uh, a, a lot of people yeah. with, with, with the legislation about one single case yeah. so so the, the one of the problems with uh, with cellular phones in Britain is as you stated uh, especially for the close persons it is not enough phones for, for the inmates to use uh, freely, as also you say, uh, telephone calls to children in the afternoon when you have 25 inmates to uh, uh, to one public phone uh, in the section, it's hard to say goodnight to the children uh, at 8 o'clock. And only the strongest get the phone in, in the end. So collateral damage. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, I have three people on the list so far. Uh, Marta Rume from University of Oslo. Yeah, uh, I think Sharon said uh, quite much of, but I had a question though. Um, it's a bit intriguing that you have a situation um, that people are putting in, put it in isolation because of things they do to get in contact with the outside world. Yeah. So another way to view this, I mean, I for sure understand the security uh, issues of, of the mobile phones and, and this situation, but it's also, it, it can be viewed as um, uh, another story of trying to get in contact, you know, for the, from, from the being isolated from society within the prison. And I know in, in um, and now I'm looking at the director from the Norwegian prison here, um, who can probably tell more of, of this, uh, in, uh, the prisoners in his prison, I guess, have 20 minutes a week on, to, uh, for, on the phone call. 20 minutes, isn't it true? Yeah. And uh, I just wonder if this is a part of the discussion here, because uh, you might, if you look at this in a different way as well, you could answer for this situation with, um, with uh, extended possibilities to have contact. Is that a part of the discussion here? Yes, in Danish prisons, in all the open prisons, uh, the pri every prisoner has a mobile phone, but it's not mobile. Uh, it is fixed in the cell, but they have a phone they can uh, call their family and their children and say goodnight and so on. But in the closed prisons, uh, they don't have a, a telephone in the cells, but they have uh, they can have permission to have ten numbers uh, uh, they can phone for 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 instance family friends uh, grandmother and children and so on. Um, but as Bo mentioned, there might be some problems because there are many prisoners for for few telephones, but uh, they have the possibility of phoning their family uh, from, even from the closed prison. I have a question from Peter, Jeff. Well, yeah, just a small comment regarding the mobile phones, because I think, that, I mean, there is, when speaking specifically about punishment cells, there is a, a simple solution to a lot of this, and this is allowing uh, prisoners to to uh, uh, call family members. That's, as far as we know, that that's what most of this is about, and that's what staff also tells us all the time. Most of these calls are about uh, staying in contact with family members. And as you just explained, Annette, uh, there's a very good system for that in the open prisons. And uh, a part of the problem here is also that remand, that one third of all prison spaces in Denmark are pre-trial remand. And the general rule is no phones at all, uh, no phone calls at all. I mean, uh, which is, is a special Danish thing. It's uh, in, in, in the UK, for example, you can easily call while you're on remand. So, uh, so that will be the easy answer, not politically, but the easy answer to, 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 to introduce a system. And of course, you tried that in the closed prisons. Uh, there was a, a trial with, with mobile phones in, in, in a closed prison on the way and was stopped by the then Minister of Justice. Uh, and, uh, and just a short question, uh, do we know the 220 cases, are any of them in open prisons? Do we know anything about that? Presumably they would not be. I'm sorry, I don't, um, I don't know. Um, we, we probably know because we made a manual examination, but I don't have the numbers. I think few of them will be in the open prison. But even in the open prison, uh, mobile phones are smuggling because uh, the, pr the mobile prisons, they have fixed to the cell. Uh, they cannot send SMSs, uh, they cannot, the same as, uh, they can phone, but it, all the things you want to use them for, you probably you cannot play and so on with them. So they still smuggle in mobile phones. Yeah, thank, it's, it's basically to Bo and maybe Anita. Um, I understand that one of the reasons is uh, to put people in punishment cell is to protect staff and to protect the other inmates. But as I stated this morning, that misbehavior, liability, uh, emotional lack of, of impulse control uh, is one of the consequences of uh, isolation. So my question is, are you not worried for your staff and the other inmates 
uh, with this raise in the amount uh, because of the mobile phone situation. That it might make so much more disturbance and anger and uh, misbehavior in the prison uh, when you put people into uh, isolation cell because of mobile phone. Uh, very much so. Um, I just have one problem. I, I, I don't see any other solutions. But when, when the day we, ha we have another solution, I think we, sh we should take that uh, as soon as possible. But, but we, also, we also have to protect uh, staff and, and protect uh, other inmates. And, and, and we see some, some very aggravated assaults uh, in ways that you can only dream about. Uh, and and, and we, we cannot allow inmates in our custody to, to get crippled for life in, in prison. So, so we have to do something to protect them. And as, and as I stated, the way we, we, we can do something about that is it, it, it's, it's in the best world we, we have some we could do something else, but, but we have yet to find out what that what that would be. Because, and, and that was really what, what, what I tried to, to state it, uh, that when you go from, from punishment cell so for a number of time, that then it's right as, as you mentioned, you, you, that, that, that something happens in here. And, 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 and it, it's, an, it's like a roundabout. If you can't find the exit, you just keep on uh, going. And at some times, at some, t at some point of view, in, 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 in that perspective, you go from punishment cell to a measurement, or as uh, Anne called, move. Uh, you, you, get, you get excluded from general population because your behavior has become so um, antisocial, the best word I can find, that, that, that you, you, you can't go back. And, and maybe it's the system that has made you so because putting you in solitary confinement. But what is the alternative for that? Is the alternative to, to leave the aggravator in general population and um, better other, other inmates? It, it, it's an, I haven't got the perfect answer, <laughs> but we have to do something. Have a question from Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And, uh, Thank you also very much for the Prison and Probation Service for coming here today because I think when we discuss these issues we need to know the reality on the ground. Now my question uh, goes to perhaps Bo but also Annette. Um, it has to do with the use of solitary confinement as a disciplinary sanction. You, was, you were saying uh, Bo that this is also to prevent reprisals. So my question would be in your experience does the use of solitary confinement make prisons more safe? Obviously they do for those two or four weeks when people are kept away, but do they then do that beyond that two or four week limit? That's my first question. And perhaps as a comment before you answer that question, I was recently with the CPT in Sweden where they have abolished solitary confinement altogether long ago uh, as a disciplinary sanction and instead what they do is they create smaller units of prisoners so they do not create those dangers so to speak that was my first point and the second one was very much arising from the discussion this morning we heard from our colleague from scotland where they reduced solitary confinement to three days that there are alternatives and alternatives which are less intrusive and just as effective and he said remove their televisions. That's a punishment. It won't create any lasting damage, but it's certainly very effective. So perhaps a question to the politicians more than to you, but at least as practitioners, do you see that as a viable alternative? Thank you. Thank you very much, Therese. We also have plenty of opportunities to discuss alternatives next panel, but a very concrete question to our colleagues from the... Mm -hmm. Yes. As for the first question, uh, if punishment cell make uh, prisons more safe, um, no, I don't think the, it does. Uh, as for the many uh, p uh, punishment cell concerning mobile phones, uh, as I said in my presentation, it's a political decision. Uh, it, we, ha we, we
we are not able to question it. Uh, we have to uh, to uh, triple. We have to triple the disciplinary punishment because that was what the politi politicians uh, asked us to do. Um, but I think as for for instance violence against staff and uh, co inmates, uh, I think. Uh, in my opinion, it would be impossible not to react to it. And uh, if they continue uh, to break the rules, I think first time you can give a warning, next time a warning, third time fine, fourth time fine, and so on. But at a, special, at a moment, you have to do something else. And that's where I lack uh, fantasy for uh, deciding what to do. Uh, I would like very much to have better ideas. Uh, I don't know if removal uh, of, of television might be an idea. Um, many prisoners probably would find it was a punishment, uh, at least if they didn't have their mobile phone, it would be a, a punishment. Uh, so perhaps you could try uh, doing something like that. But as you said, it's a political decision if they want to. It, uh, replace uh, solitary uh, uh, no um, isolation with uh, removal of, of television. Yeah. And just perhaps specify with the very serious cases where we're talking about assault, violence towards fellow prisoners or guards, that's a crime mm -hmm. that should have carried some sentence. So I'm more referring to those internal breaches of prison rules. Yeah. Okay, not giving a urine test, for instance, smuggling in a mobile phone which are not necessarily crimes as such, but disciplinary breaches. Yeah. Uh, as I said, I won't uh, discuss uh, tele mobile phone because it is a political decision. And as for all the other breaches of prison rules, you don't use uh, solitary confinement first time. You have warnings, fines, 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 and then if they repeat the crime at a, a special moment, uh, you have to do something else because in every society, in every institution, you have to have some rules, and if the, the prisoners break them, you have to react to them. So I think it's very seldom that you have a punishment cell, a punishment for, for minor crimes, for minor breaking of, of uh, rules in the institution. Paul, did you have anything to add? No? Yes, uh, I'm very. Uh uh, in the line of, of Annette, it doesn't make security any better for anyone with, with punishment. So, but maybe not be, uh, be, uh, why you should think, because m most of, of the attacks in, in, uh, in uh, the prison is ordered by someone else. Uh, if, 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 um, if you have debts, then you can pay off your debts by, uh, by, uh, by doing attacks. Uh, for the one you, you, you owe money or, or other things. So if, if, if you attack uh, a fellow uh, inmate and get X number of days in, in a punishment cell and go back, that, 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 that's just, it, um, uh, you're aware of the, of the price, you know that, that this, this is going to cost me something. And I have to pay that because I can't pay my debts for gambling, for drugs, or whatever it can be. Uh, I don't know what the, the English word is, but in, in Danish we call it uh, dummy tickets. Uh, if you do something that that, that is not uh, in the correct line of the culture on, on, on the sex scene where you, you do your hard time, then you have to pay a dummy ticket. And, and, and attacking a fellow inmate could be one way of... of, of uh, of cashing in that. So I, I don't think that, that it, it helps anything on security in, in the prison. And, and uh, just to comment on, on, the, on the minor sections, that is it, a very, very good uh, way to go. Um, in Nuborg, where, where I have uh, serviced for many years, we, we have started that on a small scale. Some of the section that, that has um, a line out where where this is possible, uh, we, we have uh, made a, a very simple uh, solution. By one door, you can cut the section in two, going from about uh, 25, 30 inmates down to 10, 12, 50 inmates, just by closing one door. But it's, it's also a, an, an economical issue uh, for the prison because it, it, it's uh, not, not only for the door, but, 
but, but it has to, to, to get some increase in staff because when you have two sections instead of one, then you also have two times the yards and, and so on. So there's, there's a financial issue and, and we're not floating in money in, in, in the Danish prisons. TV is, is, is the way we've built the, the, the prisons in Denmark. I, I can't see that, that we can exclude them from TV because every inmate has an, a TV in the cell, and there's TV in the in the um, in general populations area. You know, in, in the uh, they they have some room, some some living rooms where they can attend to. There's also TV there, so <laughs> I, I can't see that in 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 practice of being removed. I know that, that they do things a little bit different in in, in Sweden. Not not uh, everywhere they have a TV on every cell, so. It, it's it's more easy for the Swedes to do that in this in Denmark. All right, we have uh, one question down in the back. Yeah, I don't know. It's a question, but it's more like a comment from a practitioner. I'm a former uh, prosecutor, and um, I think there's one element that hasn't been mentioned when we talk about cell phones in the prisons and now being used as uh, a reason for solitary confinement uh, punishment. And that is that there is, uh, in, during investigations of certain cases, an interest from the police and prosecution or investigators that some mobile phones are present in the prison. And I know of more than one case where this has been used, uh, listening to what has been t uh, said, from the prisoners uh, to the outside world has been used as evidence, of course, with other evidence elements. But, I mean, it is a paradox that uh, there is an interest from the community, uh, from, the, from the, 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 the courts and so on, that what, what is being said, and at the same time we have this schisma of, of it being used as a, a means of punishment. I just want to mention that because I haven't heard this element you mentioned yet. Thank you. Thank you for this comment. Uh, there is also an intervention here from... Yeah. Anna? Yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Anna Ockens. I teach criminology at the DIS study abroad in Scandinavia. And I was thinking that it's most important that we have this conference now at a time where, and this, uh, the uh, foreigners may not know, there is a definite hardening of the political climate uh, in Denmark regarding criminal justice. And something that has been mentioned is that uh, we use uh, prisons as kind of a last resort, we don't know what else to do. Very often uh, politicians will refer to, yes it doesn't work, but the sense of justice demands it. And when we are then using a solitary confinement as a disciplinary measure, uh, also as a last resort, I was wondering whether we should not maybe start looking at something that you always talk about when you talk about resocialization re measures, namely what works. Because it, I haven't heard anyone say that Strafsel, uh, the disciplinary measure, that it really works. Um, and my uh, answer to what you said, Annette, about uh, can we get some suggestions, would be that you go and ask your staff and, and inmates, because as I know, they have lots of, of, uh, of great uh, ideas to what one could do instead. For instance, with the user-driven innovation that uh, the prison service has used before. And then I'd also say that my experience has been when talking to inmates who were in solitary confinement, that it could be that they were really, really volatile a couple of days before uh, when the incident happened that uh, led them to, to be there. Uh, but a couple of days later, they are maybe more uh, calm again. So one could get the impression that the inmate in question is always uh, really volatile, but that may not be the actual situation. So, so I'm thinking that one could do a lot to to avoid this, and that becomes even more important when we have uh, politicians and ministers of justice who are talking about taking away the teams in general, taking away the relationship uh, building work of prison officers, etc. Maybe this was more of a comment, but, but also a suggestion. 
Thank you very much. Uh, any reactions from the panel on this uh, hardened political climate and how to respond? Uh, thank you, Anne, for mentioning uh, the user-driven innovation because that was one thing I would have mentioned uh, as uh, one way to counteract uh, breaches. Uh, perhaps not everybody uh, knows what it is. Um, it is a pilot project, what you would call it, that we have used uh, in a, a few prisons where we have tried to bring together the users, uh, which means the inmates and the staff, uh, and uh, putting them together uh, in order to define um, how do we, we make a well-functioning society in, in this uh, unit and uh, what rules do we have to follow and um, how can we get the best uh, for all of us, a win-win situation. And we have had very good, good results. I'm sure we don't have any uh, punishment cells, uh, at least very few in, in this uh, units. But I'm afraid you cannot use it everywhere because a uh, condition is that the prisoners want to talk to the staff. It's not like that in all our uh, units. We have some prisoners who don't want to talk to the staff. Um, but I think as far as possible you should use uh, uh, measures like that uh, in order to um, not to uh, not to as an alternative measure but as a way to uh, counteract um, breaches uh, which uh, may cause uh, punishment cell. A comment for uh, Anne's comment. Uh, if you want to see an increase in punishment cell, then take away the relationship work between the staff uh, and the inmates. That's, that's the, the fastest way to disaster. Uh, if, if we don't build a relationship uh, and I know that there's not much to build on, but, but we, we try. If, if you don't build a relationship to, to the inmates, that, that there's nothing holding them back and attacking us. We, we, we don't have any means other than a good relationship with the inmates to, to, uh, to provide some sort of, of safe haven in, in the prison. We have to have relationships. It, it, it's, it's the only way. If you remove that, then they, they, have, they have nothing holding them back. They don't know us, we don't know they, uh, them, and, and so it, 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 it's vital that, that we keep that. The political wins uh, these days, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, not, it's very, very bad. Um, maybe I'll just jump in and, and ask uh, Morten what, what you see as the role of the NPM in also participating in this uh, uh, hardened climate and this... Uh, well, I'd say that on the one hand, the Ombudsman traditionally has not got himself involved in politics. He's appointed by Parliament, but he's not supposed to be criticizing Parliament. So when they pass an act, like we've just heard about the increase of punishment for the possession of mobile phones, he doesn't make a protest about it. On the other hand, I would also say that <coughs> as an MPM, you have the obligation to uphold human standards, human rights standards, and um, naturally that applies also in this field, so whenever we can, we, we do try to push towards, um, towards the conditions which are, um, what's the word, which are better seen from the point of view of human rights. And maybe I, I can ask from, from my experience working with, with the Ombudsman that, that the Ombudsman can work in, in, in many, many, many different ways. And one of the ways is basically putting things on the agenda in our meetings with the, with the criminal service and, and other institutes with the health uh, organizations and, and hospitals and so on. Um, so, you know, work can still be done that you basically notch the system by asking questions and then putting it on the agenda. Uh, then you lift the, the barriers uh, without ever having to put your, your pen on uh, on paper. Um, so a lot of the work, I think a lot of the successes of the of the Ombudsman Institution and, and of the OMPED Corporation basically is really very visible uh, because it goes on on a, a more on an everyday, everyday basis. Um, so I think that basically by, by also being part of this discussion basically helps uh, the debate move, move forward. Uh, but nobody really has the hammer to 
to get the politicians where most of us would think they, they should be elsewhere, but uh, that's the name of name of the game today. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question or a comment from Gert down in the back. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, of course, we are hugely grateful to have all these uh, experts joining into the discussion and enlightening us on, on the situation. Um, I'm wondering, um, many of our colleagues working in the South um, find that um, solitary confinement is first of all not, not often a problem because overcrowding is the problem. Um, but secondly, um, in terms of, you mentioned Bo very um, rightly, the relation between staff and inmates is really key to safety for all inside prisons. Um, we have the, um, the perspective of, of um, what it is that we want the institutions to do. I think Jonas, you mentioned the rehabilitation perspective. What is it that comes out in the end? I'm a little bit curious about the, the relation between retention rates and the use of isolation or solitary confinement. Um, I don't know whether we have the data to look at it, but certainly in whether you visit a prison in, in Yemen or in Albania or in, in other places around the world, you'd find staff saying, have a heart. I mean, there some, in some places they'd quite readily uh, dish out all kinds of punishment, but they would never confine someone. Um, because it simply is so ingrained as a, as a human standard. Um, and the whole idea of keeping social relations, the whole idea of having a network outside prison, both to supply hygienic pads or food or whatever, um, and also to be there for the day uh, the inmate needs to leave the prison, is so closely ingrained in the whole purpose of having, having um, having the, the, the um, prison institution as part of society. And prisoners would often um, prefer to be in the prison, which is right in the middle of a city, but with very, very poor conditions inside, than to be in this perfectly nicely built prison outside, because they lose their social relations, both um, to people outside, but also sometimes to people inside. Um, so I'm kind of wondering about this aspect of the, of the, the risk that is uh, both we've had the health risks, but also the risks of, for the for the retention rates and for the, the the period after prison. Whether there's a, a public debate, um, at least in the Danish or in the Nordic or in the um, professional um, uh, association on um, what is the right way to go about for future. Thank you for this comment. Um, any reactions? But uh, definitely it also resonates with me that uh, many prison administrations uh, further down south on this uh, globe uh, is very reluctant to put people in isolation. Um, but um, maybe we have a comment on that from our colleague Andrew. Yeah? <laughs> No, not on that. Not on that, okay. <laughs> Swimming in the same sea. But on, on something else, I'd very much <laughs> like to invite the panel to, to, um, to think a little bit out of the box about punishment, uh, sort of on our behalf. It seems like we're swimming around a little bit in a sea of how to punish better. Like, should it be locking them up or should it be taking their TV? And I wonder if we can somehow delve a little bit more deeply into this notion of, of punishment. Is there scope to think beyond punishment? And maybe Jonas can help us out with this from a sort of human rights perspective. I mean, my experience is a lot of human rights and development agencies also get take punishment for granted. So they try to create better criminal justice systems or build nicer prisons in, in the South without ever really fundamentally questioning what this is about punishment. So for me, punishment is about the infliction of pain. And we inflict pain on people by putting them in single cells in order to solve some issue of aggravation or assault or mobile phone or whatever. Now, why on earth do we think that the infliction of pain solves those problems? Is there an alternative to this whole discourse of punishment that we take for granted? Uh, could we think something about, instead of doing punishment better, 
doing justice better? Would that be an alternative? Yeah, I think some of these things might also be raised in the next panel, but I don't know if uh, you want to respond directly on this or... Well, but only to say, I, I wish I had an answer, in a, in a, if I had an answer to that in a general sense of how could we um, have law and order in society without punishment, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't you know, travel around ever having received my Nobel Peace Prize um, in how to make the, the world a much better place. Um, and, and I'm not an expert in, in this field, but of course it has to do with relationships and who's in the, the, I mean, the population, what kind of prison population do you have, uh, what are their conditions, what are their relationships, what, how, how much are they, you know, the access to family and, and everything. Uh, I mean, you basically need to deal with everything at the same time in order to, to make life better for people also inside. So I, I don't have the specific answer, how, how can you do away with the... Uh, with one, it's basically we're talking about one, one kind of sanction to all kinds of disciplinary and criminal offences inside a prison. Uh, and I doubt that anybody can has the silver bullet. Because you probably have to, you know, have the whole uh, cannon out and, and shoot at everything at the same time in order to, to decrease it as much as possible. And, and, and some, places, some places it works, some places it doesn't work. But I'm eager to hear also the next panel, I have more specific ideas on what you have to fire at. So, uh, to get, uh, get good results in this. We have uh, two minutes left. Uh, okay, who you have comment on this? Yeah, please. I think in, 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 in Denmark, we, we uh, for recent years, have tried something new. Uh, it's called a, a food chain. And it's not the one from Texas, you know, with the iron ball. And, no. It's, it's a, like a GPS tracker. And it, well, it, it doesn't uh, remove all prisoners from the prison, but it, it, it takes, well, the best ones out of prison and, and gives them an alternative choice for being uh, around the family and uh, education and working while doing uh, the punishment. So, it, it doesn't solve all the problems, and, and especially not the, the problems with the, the hardened criminal, but you have to start somewhere. Okay, thank you. As mentioned, we have uh, just a few minutes left. I have two questions in the front, and then I'm closing. Uh, um, if you, I can take your two questions, and then we'll run off, run off with the panel, please. My name is Jorgen. I have been a prison check. Okay. <coughs> I have been a prison chaplain in Copenhagen prisons for 38 years and a member of the CPT in eight years. Uh, and my question is more general. I think uh, Annette and Bo, they are getting to the point uh, that uh, um, I think that the, the, the problem is not punishment. I think the problem I hear today is what we could call government interference in prison management. <laughs> Honestly, I think so because, you know, uh, I think, I, I wonder how prisons would look like in Denmark if Annette uh, had, the total, <laughs> had the total power to decide. And even if Paul, if, if uh, the... <laughs> okay. <laughs> if the pri prison guards had something to say about management. Uh, 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 why is it a political question? I think Foucault called prisons for hospitals. I wonder if uh, government would dare to go into ordinary hospitals and order how patients would be treated. Serious, I mean it. Why do govern politi uh, the politicians always go inside and in details uh, try to decide how prisons uh, uh, should be should be managed. I'm convinced that if we, it was uh, expert prison experts uh, had the, the the power or the decision, we would not use solitary confinement as a disciplinary measure. What we are discussing today is that it is a political problem. Everybody wants to abolish uh, solitary confinement. The same with uh, mobile phones. 
I would ask, why are prisons almost always so conservative? A prison, prison societies are always 50, at least 50 years behind the development in ordinary society. In the CPT, we have one standard which is very good, which says that healthcare in prisons should have the same standard as the healthcare outside the prisons. Could we not make this principle global? <laughs> you know, could you imagine that prisoners were not allowed to watch TV, for instance? Okay? Prisoners once were not allowed to, to write letters. When I came to the Western prison uh, 40 years ago, there was no telephone access for prisoners. The only way a prisoner could make a telephone call was to ask the social worker or the chaplain. So as a chaplain, I used all my time to take prisoners to the telephone. <laughs> Okay, now we are discussing mobile phones. Everybody has mobile phones. You cannot uh, uh, remove mo mobile phones from, 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 from prisons. Uh, some years ago, I went to a prison in, uh, in, uh, in the Czech Republic. It was a big prison, 900 prisoners. They had two telephones and one of them was broken. <laughs> And I went into the to, to, to the cells and talked to the prisoners because I was a specialist in contact with the outside world, of course. And I said, oh, you have a big problem here. You have two telephones and one is broken and you are 900 prisoners. Oh, no, 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 no. don't worry, uh, chaplain, don't worry. We have mobile phones. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, something which is going on in, in, in prison is simply idiotic and the prisoners and prisoners are re reacting against uh, against that I, I only want my message would only be could we not make some resistance against the tyranny of the politicians <laughs> who dis in, in, uh, who because they now a uh, governor you are uh, 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 damage controller, aren't you? You are damage controller. So I think it's a, I think it's the main problem that we should ask for more freedom for uh, gov uh, prison government to govern the prisons in an adequate and a modern way. Thank you. Thank you very much for this comment. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, we have one last uh, question before we close. Yeah. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm a student at Copenhagen University. Um, I was just wondering, out of the 222 cases of prolonged solitary confinement, um, how many involved the same individual? And is there a similar trend uh, for the sort of total number of solitary confinement? Like, do you see a lot of sort of repeat offenders? It's a very concrete question, and I'm sorry I'm not able to, to answer it. It, it covered uh, a lot of uh, prisoners, not the same prisoner, all of them, but uh, if there are two or three or four covering the, uh, the same person, I don't know. So I'm sorry I'm not able. It's a very quick, uh, uh, it, no, it took a long time to go through uh, 222 cases, but uh, we made it manually, um, and uh, it hasn't been described in details uh, till now uh, anyway. Thank you very much for uh, the good questions from the audience. And okay, do you want to add? Yes, please. Just a brief. Uh, I haven't made any studies about uh, about this, but staff in, in, in these uh, sections, the solitary confinement sections, they know almost all the inmates who always go into this section. We know by by, by name. So, so that it's you know uh, it, it, it's always almost the same uh, inmates that, that land on these sections uh, the same the same offenses but, but I have no really, I haven't studied this but uh, no uh, I, I, I lifted yes all right excellent I think we're ready for sugar and caffeine and uh, stretches and legs and yeah. um, we've had a good session I think thank you to Anette, to Morten, to Jonas and Bo and thank you to the audience for the good questions I think we covered a lot of issues uh,
There is issues about statistics and data. Uh, do we have the adequate data? Is it uh, sharp enough? Uh, is it uh, an opportunity for us to, to, um, to actually inspect these, uh, these situations? We need more research, especially uh, focusing on this particular topic uh, around uh, uh, punitive um, isolation. Uh, we've heard from the NPM that uh, there is also an opportunity to, to go across and pick up good practices and maybe also uh, to encourage and spread that and nudge the system uh, also um, informally uh, and also the attention to the fact, as we also heard from Malcolm and others this morning, that punishment uh, cells is, is among a regime of uh, solitary confinement um, measures. Uh, which also makes us maybe think a little bit more general about punishment with this particular unique uh, system within the system, the hard end of the, of the prison um, sanctions. Um, we also heard from Bo that uh, there are concerns about staff uh, hardening uh, in these environments, maybe also a, a request uh, for, for, um, for support to, to handle that. Uh, and we've heard uh, good, critical, sobering comments and questions from our colleagues from abroad around these mobile phones. Uh, and uh, I think that has also been quite uh, important. Last but not least, we've had a good discussion about the effects of uh, um, punishment cells. Is it actually effective? And um, if not, uh, should we then think a little bit more about other ways of doing things uh, and we'll learn about that in the next panel but as uh, Jonas said there are low hanging fruits uh, let's try to, to push for uh, at least the 15 days uh, minimum standard and focus on vulnerable groups um, as, as a priority so thank you very much uh, it's been a rich panel uh,